Okay, hello everyone, welcome back to the 18th lecture of Introduction to Stable Homotopy Theory. And today we'll finish the story of bus field localizations and perhaps start the story about Tom Spectra. Uh, we'll see. I also would like to give a very, very sketchy description of chromatic homotopy theory, if I, if I can. Uh, today will be, perhaps this first part will be a bit more sketchy than, than usual because I won't be able to prove everything that I want to give you at least a flavor of how the theory goes. How do you decompose further this p-complete homotopy theory? And it's an example that you, you, you we, we can actually work out in some detail. The goal is to compute LKU of a spectrum X. In particular, the first step, but and the main step actually, but uh, we will get more information in the process of doing this is as to prove that this is a smashing localization. It's obtained by tensoring LKU of S by X. Uh, and then also give a description, an explicit description of LKU of S. I'll write it as a pullback of some spectra that are quite explicit, actually. And uh, OK, to do so, we will use the arithmetic fracture square that we described last time. So our goal, the steps are describing uh, LKUX rational and LKUX P complete for every P. And the first one is actually quite easy. So I'll write it as a general statement. So the lemma is uh, let E be a spectrum such that its rationalization is non zero or if you want such that there is some non-torsion element in its homotopy groups, evidently. And then for any spectrum X, we have that the rationalization of the E localization is equivalent to just the rationalization. Or if you want, uh, i.e. the map X goes to LEX is a rational equivalence. So the rational part is easy, as I often uh, recall. Uh, you don't, you just literally, it's, you just give what its rational homotopy groups are and you know everything. Okay. So proof, the proof is it's easy. So let A be the fiber of this map. This is a, a uh, sorry, E acyclic. We need to prove it is uh, Q acyclic. That's all that we need to prove, literally. So we know that E tensor A is zero. Therefore, uh, its rationalization is zero. So far, so good. But remember, rationalizing is a smashing localization. So that's the same thing as tensoring by EQ is zero. And now, and EQ is just a sum, sorry, of shifted copies of HQ. Uh, we had a more canonical description as some of the shifted angular plane spectra of the rationalized homotopy groups, but of course uh, that doesn't matter. And that's non-zero by hypothesis. So that so EQ tensor A is zero if and only if HQ tensor A is zero. And that's the end of the proof. And of course we used 
uh, that EQ is non zero for this implication to show that there is at least one HQ sum under that. Because if EQ is zero, then this, of course, doesn't work. Okay, so the rational part is easy. Uh, let's see what we can say about the P complete part. The P complete part is where the, the interesting things happen. So let's see. Uh, oh. I wrote this. Okay. I didn't finish writing the proof in the notes. Okay. Well, uh, let's improvise. It's not a hard theorem. Anyway, so let E be a spectrum. Any spectrum. And okay, X another spectrum. Uh, but then the you take the E localization of X and you P complete, and that's the same thing as the um, E mod B. Uh, localization of X. So that gives us a description of the P completion in terms of another of another Bauss field localization. And uh, actually, let me prove first an additional lemma that we need in the proof of this lemma. So let okay E be a spectrum. E actually E X E spectra. So uh, then the P completion of X is E local if and only if X mod P is E local. And the proof is actually easy. So remember, we had a fiber sequence. S mod P goes to S mod P to the N plus one, uh, N, say S mod P to the N minus one. Oh, sorry. Uh, before I say this, I should say that one implication is clear. Uh, since X mod P is the P completion mod P, uh, this is clear. Sorry, forgot to mention that. So what we need, now we need to do the other implication. So remember we have a fiber sequence. So we get a fiber sequence like this. Therefore, if X mod P is E local, then X mod P to the N is E local for every N. That's by induction on N and using that E local spectra are closed under extensions. But then, The P completion, which we have seen to be the limit of X mod P to the N, is E local, since E local spectra are closed under limits. So let me move the statements downstairs. This is going to be helpful to have it here. Yeah. Take this way.
Okay. And let's prove this lemma now. So if I run the spectrum, okay, so. Uh, okay. So the map X goes to L E X P complete is an E mod P equivalence because you can factor it as first you go to L E and then to its P completion. And this is an E equivalence and therefore an E mod P equivalence because if you have an E acyclic spectrum, you can tensor it by, by E mod P and you get zero. So it's e acyclic and that's an uh, S mod P equivalence for the same reason. If you have something that's a zero after tensoring to by S mod P, it's zero also in tensoring by, by uh, E mod P because it factors as. So the, the only matter is to show that that guy is E mod P local. And so note that by the lemma, the previous lemma, E X P is E local. Uh, because you, you because if you take it mod p, that's the same thing as l of x mod p, which is e local. So, okay. So now. Let A uh, E mod P local. This means exactly that E tensor A mod P is zero. Therefore, maps. E tensor A mod P into this guy, which, uh, sorry, E mod P is cyclic, not local. Uh, and remember, this guy is, uh, sorry, not E, tensor A mod P. So this guy is E local. I'm making a mess. So, okay, let me say it differently. Okay, let A is E mod P a cyclic. Therefore, E tensor A mod P is zero. Therefore, uh, A mod P is E a cyclic. And therefore, the mapping spectrum from A mod P to this P completed L E X is zero. Therefore, multiplication by P from the mapping spectrum from A into this guy. is an equivalence. Uh, but this guy is also P complete. Because, uh, well, you can write it as limits over N of maps A L E X mod P to the N. And then you can bring it the, the, the N outside. In general, mapping into a P complete guy always gives you something P complete with this argument. Okay, we have a P complete spectrum where P acts invertibly. Uh, well, therefore, this guy is zero. as we wanted. Again, this is a bit of a bunch of tricks so you can. Probably uh, guess 
how these things go on your own, but yeah. Questions? Excuse me, this is probably a very basic question, but why does P completion commutes with this mapping thing on the second variable? I mean, how do, how, why can you put the limit outside? No, the limit outside you can always put. The, the magic is I can put this fraction outside, actually. Map A blank is a right adjoint. So I can always put, put limits out. What the, okay. What's the difference with, right. with, with uh, uh, BDM groups is that now I can also put the quotient outside because right adjoints commute with cofibers, which, which is a consequence of stability. Okay. Cofiber sequences are the same thing as fiber sequences. Okay, great, thanks. So that's, that's why this doesn't work for abelian groups, but it works for spectra and it works also in the derived category of abelian groups, of course. Uh, Okay. Okay, so summing up, we have a pullback square. Here we have the KU localization of X going to the rationalization of X here. And here you go over P L K U mod P X. And then the adelic part which again is completely determined by their homotopy groups. So that's not that bad. Our goal now is to understand uh, LKU mod P X. And here I'm going to have to bring uh, some, some actual computations. So I'll need the existence of two maps. One of them, you should have at least hinted at it in the exercise session, but I'll, I'll mention it again. And the other is, well, it's sort of an important object, but okay. So we need the following facts. So fact one, there exists a map of rings of ring spectra, and so far in this class, I've only defined homotopy ring spectra, so you can think a map of homotopy ring spectra, but in fact, it's, it's even a map of infinity ring spectra if you have this definition. Psi r from ku p to the p completion, ku to p completion of ku for every uh, r co-prime with p. Now, if I understand correctly, in the exercise session, you've seen the existence of these at the level of spaces. And Pavel has said that it doesn't dilute the KU, which is absolutely true. But it does dilute if to the P completion if R is co prime with P. And in fact, these gives an action of the profinite group ZP cross on KUP, but we don't need it. I'm just mentioning because, well, because it's important. And then we need, and then this fact one is actually not that hard to construct. You've already done it at the level of spaces with a little bit of effort, you can upgrade it to a map of spectra and see that some map of homot appearing spectra is. It's not hard. I'm just not doing it for lack of time, but this could do. The second part is harder. So there exists, and here I'll write stuff for P out and then explain how to modify it for P equals two, because unfortunately that's P equals two is kind of special in this story. So there exists a map V1 from sigma 
two p minus one of s mod p to itself. And here I'm saying v one to the I'm going to call it v one to the fourth from c mod eight s mod two to s mod two, um, which is a KU equivalence. And this is harder to construct, so let me tell you briefly where this comes from. Uh, so V1 is constructed so that it fits in a diagram. So here I have so s two p minus one s p, and here you can consider uh, the boundary map of the sequence defining s mod p. Here you can actually consider just the projection mod p. Here there is a map alpha p where alpha p lives in pi 2p minus 3 of the sphere and is the smallest element. Sorry, it's the element in smallest degree. Uh, of order p. So it's the smallest piece of p torsion in the homotopy groups of spheres. And of course, I would need to prove that such alpha p exists and that uh, this factorization also exists. And that this factorization implies that v1 is a map, it's an equivalence on ku. Uh, a reference for this, by the way, is Adam's paper on the groups. Jx4. Uh, don't be too afraid that it's the fourth paper in a series. It's kind of standalone. You can read it pretty much on its own. Uh, ooh, but I shouldn't misspell Adam's name. Poor guy. Um, and again, this is also not super hard. In one lecture, I think I could do it. But for the sake of brevity, I'm going to skip it because I'm going to need a third fact, and that is def I definitely couldn't do it in one lecture. Um, but let's put together fact one and fact two and see what this gives us. Uh, so, so we have, since psi r from kup to kup is a map of rings, Uh, there exists a null homotopy of the composition from the sphere to KUP to KUP complete psi r minus one. This is just saying that psi r composed with the unit is homotopic to the unit. That's a particular consequence of. Uh, of psi r being a map of rings. Therefore, a null homotopy. And actually, since the target is, the fiber of the target is p-complete, I can as, as well p-complete on the source. And therefore, a null homotopy of s mod p, ku mod p, K U mod P. But I'm going to keep calling this map psi R minus one, even if S mod P is not a ring anymore. Careful. But I can still take the, um, the sequence above and take mod P. That's still allowed. OK. Uh, but OK, but now all these maps, all did this new homotopic sequence or actually this, let me say this fragment at least, oh, sorry, 2p minus one, gets a multiplication by v1 map. Uh, 
in these commutes. And this is an equivalence because V1 was a KU equivalence. And also this fits, of course. This other piece of the sequence. So long story short, if we define S mod B with V1 inverted uh, as the co-limit of this thing, so I think I need to put a minus here. So I'm taking essentially the formal, I'm formally inverting V1 and, and the homotopy of S mod P. We get a map S mod P like this, KU mod P, KU mod P, psi R minus one. And we still have a null homotopy of the composition since this is a co-limit of sequences equipped with a null homotopy. So, so we get a sequence. So I give you two maps and a null homotopy of the composition. And now that this is fact three, which is really hard, it's a hard computation. Uh, this is a fiber sequence. And uh, okay, actually, I should perhaps say a couple of things about how you you fix this for for p equals two. For p equals two, you get a map. Well, I can you invert v one to the fourth. It's the same. Well, okay, let's move it like this. Uh, but here we have to put ko. We have to put the real piece instead of ku. Doesn't matter, but it's a bit annoying in this setting. Okay, in fact, three is a uh, is actually very related to the computation of the image of J that uh, Pavel might have explained a bit in in the exercise session. Uh, the idea is well, the homotopy groups of this fiber are easy to compute, and the computation of the image of J actually can be uh, can be put by showing that the map from these to the fiber of these is a subjection of homotopy groups. And then you do some really hard computations and you show that the, the, these spectrum here and the fiber of these have the same cardinality in homotopy. So if you have a subjection between two groups with the same cardinality, then it is an isomorphism. And that's, that's hard. But, uh, I be honest, I do not understand the full computation, even if I read it a couple of times. Uh, it's quite hard. And this was done actually. So the computation was Adams and Baird. And maybe I should also put the name Miller here. And the observation that this computation proves, uh, proves this result is due to Bousfield. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm a little lost. Um, so why do I get that this, if you scroll up the, this composition from SP completed, yeah, that this composition is, a, is null homotopic? Uh, well, Psi R is a map of rings. In particular, ah. the following diagram commutes. Ah, okay, okay. It's a map of rings and this is the unit included. Yes, exactly. Ah, okay, I did not get this. Okay, okay, thank you. Write it here. So fact, as I said, fact one and fact two are 
take a while, but are not super hard. Fact three is significantly harder, and I'd be lying if I say they understand the complete proof. Um, if someone has a very nice way of thinking of this proof, I would love to hear it. Uh, but there are also, I mean, there are, we will see in a second that there are deeper reasons for fact three to be harder than fact one and fact two. There are higher analogs of fact one and fact two, but the higher analog of fact three is an open conjecture. Uh, so, and people believe it to be false, actually. So, it's a, uh, when you start learning the theory, you realize that fact three is of a different nature. In fact, one, in fact, two. But okay, with this, armed with this, now we can uh, remark. Oh, there, uh, there is a remark I should have done like two weeks ago that I forgot to do and I need it now. So let me put it here. So remark, if E is a homotopy ring spectrum, which is a monoid, I call it a monoid in the homotopy category of spectra. And M is a module over E in, in the homotopy category of spectra. That is, you have maps E tensor M to M that are associative up to homotopy. And what I'll need actually is that this composite here. Sorry where the first is the unit is the identity. Uh, then M is E local. In particular, E itself is E local, which is not true in general. Uh, uh, so this might be a bit surprising perhaps for people. But for, for basically all the localizations we consider, this is going to be the case because we are going to localize more often than not that homotopy ring spectra. So the proof is so that A E a cyclic, uh, then map A comma M is a retract of map E tensor A comma M, which is zero. And that's because you can get a map and this map comes from a precomposition with the unit of E. You have a map A. Ooh, why am I doing this? this? No, am I doing this the right way? Yes. Okay. You precompose with the unit of it. And here, you can just tensor by E by functoriality and then multiply. No. Wait one second. Uh, No, uh, I'm doing it in the other, in the wrong direction. Uh, you have a map from A to M. You go to a map from E tensor A, E tensor M, and you go, and now you multiply on M, of course. And the composition of these two guys is the identity. And so, where mu is this multiplication map. So sorry, why do I need this, this remark? Because I needed to know that KU is KU local. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't know how to do these things. And in particular, that KU mod P is KU local. Because therefore, from fact, therefore, sorry, KU mod P is KU local. 
and so from fact three we get s not p if v1 inverted is ku local therefore s mod p v1 inverted is the ku localization of s mod p and that's the important fact it's actually quite easy to show that s mod p and s mod p with v1 inverted have the same ku localization because v1 is a ku equivalence but the key important fact is is this fact here yes can you look up and okay more generally you can take x mod p with v1 inverted and this is going to be lku of x mod p because the left hand side is the fiber of a map um, ku mod p tensor x ku mod p tensor x and so ku local And this is one of the equivalent forms of the telescope conjecture, but I'm going to reserve that name for the statement I'm going to prove now. Uh, so it, you will see that it's an immediate consequence of this fact. And okay, so this is corollary, which is a telescope conjecture in height one. Uh, let E X be a spectrum. Then X is KU local if and uh, only if for every P prime the map V1 from sigma to P minus two of X mod P to X mod P or V1 to the fourth from sigma eight X mod two to X mod two for the P equals two case is an equivalence. So that's uh, well, that's a very interesting statement. This involves uh, this connects being KU local with. Uh, some kind of uh, periodicity on X. In fact, in particular, note that if X is KU local, the homotopy groups of X mod P are periodic because there is this multiplication by v1 uh, with period 2p minus 2 and in fact we have the homotopy groups the mod p homotopy groups of the ku localization are exactly the homotopy groups of p with v1 inverted that's a consequence actually of the fact that i, I claimed before 
that the KU localization of X is X mod, uh, X mod B is X mod B with B1 inverted. So the LKU in U sees the V1 periodic part of mod P homotopy groups. And by the way, I'm saying it for the homotopy group self, but of course it's true for homology groups for any homology theory. So for example, mod P homology of X is going to be V1 periodic. Okay. Um, questions about this statement before I, I prove it? No. Okay, good. So, proof. Uh, well, okay, V1 is a KU equivalence. So, uh, if X is KU local, V1. Uh, P minus one is an equivalence for every P. So that's easy. Uh, because the fiber is acyclic and the KU local. Therefore, do. Okay, so good. So the, the problem is the other direction. But we know that LKU of X mod P is X mod P with V1 inverted. So if V1 is an equivalence, we have X mod P is KU local. Therefore, by the lemma we have seen, the P completion of X is K local. And, and XQ is also K local by that lemma we have seen. And so X is K local. Okay, so we say SQ and also the adelic part, which is rational, is K local. And this guy is KU local. That's because they're rational. Rational spectra we have seen are always KU local. So this periodicity statement allows us to give us a, a very clean uh, a very clean characterization of KU local spectra in terms of some kind of periodicity on the mod P homotopy groups. And uh, well, that's the beginning of a very important story on which I'll say a couple of things. But as a further corollary, let me say that uh, LKUX is LKU sphere tensor X, i.e. LKU is smashing. And why this is a corollary? Uh, so first note that uh, X goes to 
LES tensor X is always an E equivalence for every E. So the only thing we need to prove is that the right hand side is local in our case. And that's because I you know the fiber is obtained by X tensor some E acyclic spectrum. And so it's E acyclic. Huh. But now we have a very convenient criterion to check when stuff is KU local. So we need to check V1 from 2P minus 1 uh, LKUS tensor X mod P LKU tensor X. Oof. Ah. K S tensor X mod P is an equivalence. But now, well, that's we know who this guy is. This guy is exactly S mod P with V1 inverted. If. And this is obviously an, this is an equivalence by definition. As you can see, uh, constructed uh, once you have fact three, this this theorem is very very easy. And actually, it would follow only by knowing that S mod B with V one inverted is K U local. If someone were able to prove it by other means, that would be enough. But I don't know of any proof that doesn't pass through uh, that fiber sequence. And I'm very skeptical that it would exist, honestly. Okay, so we almost have a complete description of KU localization. We just need to understand the KU localization of the sphere. And I'm going to use the arithmetic pullback square. So to understand LKUS, it's enough to understand uh, LKUS be completed. But thankfully, we have a uh, we have a very simple description now of this guy that allows us to compute all these homotopy groups actually in a very explicit and, and, and concrete fashion. So recall, we have a sequence by which I mean a pair of composable maps plus a new homotopy of their composition uh, S K U P complete. Psi R minus one P K U P complete. And the fiber in particular is both uh, K U local and uh, P complete. So, oh, I recall this was L K U mod P of the sphere, by the way. So we get a sequence. And we claim this is a fiber sequence. Why is that? Well, everything in sight is P complete. Indeed, everything 
is p complete. So it's enough. to check it's a fiber sequence. Mod P. But mod P, well, but this was the, the fiber sequence. Constructed using fact three. So actually, let me give a name to this thing. Let me call JP to be the fiber of KU mod P. So I, uh, oh, sorry, haha. <laughs> no one asked me a quite important question. I keep writing psi r, but this is clearly not true for every r. For example, for r equals to zero, it's obviously false. So someone should have asked me which r do I pick for this for fact three. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention it. So let me go back to fact three and just say well, I could say that there exists an r. And this is a fiber sequence, but for R, topological generator of ZP cross. ZP cross is a pro-cyclic group, so you can pick. Or if you want, it's the same thing as saying that R is a, a multiplicative generator of Z mod P to the N cross for every N. And uh, what goes wrong for P plus two is exactly that Z two cross is not pro-cyclic. Or if you want the Z mod two to the N is not cyclic which you might or might not have done many years ago in a first algebra class. So you have to, to pass to KO that sort of takes care of the spurious Z mod two factor in Z two cross. Sorry, I forgot to mention it. Of course, you need to choose a, a particularly good R. I think R equals three is good, mod two or something like that, I don't remember. Um, there are formulas you can look. It's a purely arithmetic invariant. But anyway, I have this ZP. Uh, and for those of you that are curious, this is exactly the homotopy fixed point by the action of ZP cross. And by the way, this is true also for P equals two. It's just that the homotopy fixed point, since it's not cyclic, it's not computed just by taking the fixed point of a generator anymore. Okay, and so summing it up, you get that this guy is a pullback. And this gives us a, as complete a description as you can hope. Uh, since Psi R, it's easy to, to figure out its action on homotopy groups. It's actually multiplication by uh, R to the 2N in degree. To R to the n, sorry, in degree 2n. Um, you can actually compute the homotopy groups of everything inside, get along with that sequence, and get the homotopy groups of these. Uh, and I just mentioned a following remark for those of you that have seen the story about the image of J in the exercise session. Uh, the map psi, pi star of S to pi star of these KU local homotopy groups is the projection onto the image of J for star greater or equal than one, where J is a certain homomorphism from pi star of O to pi star of S. And its image, it's not, it's not injective, but its image is a summand of pi star of S. And the splitting is given exactly by this. And it's a summand, sorry, for star greater or equal than one.
So that's why this LKUS spectrum is sometimes called also the non-connective image of J spectrum. And that's also why like these, these are the P-complete image of J spectrum. That's why they're called JP. Uh, and there is more I could say about this, but I prefer to stop here for, for this. And I want to just give an idea of how this story can be generalized to understand deeper and deeper information in the pi star of the sphere. But first, are there questions about this? So what happened is that people developed essentially this story that culminated in, in work by Balsfield, Adams, Adams Baird, Miller, etc., as I mentioned before. And people start asking, okay, that's cool. Uh, can we do this, this thing further? So the idea was, okay, we have, and we have understood a piece of the P-complete homotopy theory. So, but can we look at Bowsfield Bows field localization at S mod P comma V1, by which I mean the cofiber of V1. So because we understand completely the part that what happens when V1 is inverted. So now our next step is probably look at what happens when V1 is completed. And can we, can we go further? Can we find a V2 perhaps uh, that plays, that, that, that gives us uh, an interesting periodic part when you invert it and then you complete and you go further. And you can indeed, but to understand what's going on, it's better to mention a little bit uh, what's the arithmetic data that's controlling this story. So I have to mention there exists a spectrum called MU, uh, which actually we will define uh, at the very beginning of the next topic. Well, it's a special case of a Tom spectrum. We'll define Tom spectra and so in particular also MU. Uh, that is the universal spectrum with a theory of churn classes. If you've never seen churn classes, it doesn't matter. It's just, I'm just mentioning it for, um, for people that have seen them. I will say stuff about orientability and et cetera later. Um, but such stuff exists. And pi star of a mu is particularly easy to understand. Uh, so you can write it as an infinite polynomial ring with ai in degree 2i, but that's not actually a very uh, useful, I mean, no, it is useful, but it's not a very conceptual description. It's better to understand it in terms of formal group laws. So definition, f, so r ring, a formal group law is a power series F in x1, x2 that behaves sort of like the Taylor expansion of a group operation at zero. So such that, well, okay, I'm going, it's technically commutative and one dimensional. So let me put the commutativity here. Uh, f x comma zero is x, x zero comma x is x, and then I need some kind of associativity condition. And that's it. Invertibility is forced by the inverse function theorem. Oh, sorry, no, no, yeah, yeah. Invertibility is forced by the inverse function theorem here. So. So it's good. 
And uh, well, for those of you that know what churn classes are, uh, the churn, the behavior of the churn classes uh, on MU equips pi star MU with a formal group flow. But it's even better. So, okay, let me say that the Lazard ring L is the free the ring with uh, the universal ring with a formal group flow. And uh, it's, it's you can define it. You can just take L is defined as Z with uh, C I J um, for that are the coefficients are from a group flow modulo whatever relations you need so that F of X comma Y sum C I J X I Y J is a formal group flow. You can just write it down. It's just a purely algebraic gadget. And the theorem is the pi star of mu. Well, actually, sorry, I should attribute some theorem by Quillen, which is the magic thing that makes everything work. Is that pi star of mu is equivalent to L. And why did I did that? When did I say that? It's because by identifying a mu with L, we can identify some special elements in, in a mu which I'll call VI. So, okay. Um, questions so far about this definition? No? Okay. That's good. So, if we define multiplication by P is a power series in only one variable. Px is just F of X. P factors. It's, you know, multiplication by P. Not very surprisingly, perhaps. And these, and I'm going to need these to define inductively. So multiplication by P, you can see by the hypothesis is Px plus higher terms. Actually, plus higher terms. That's an easy, easy proof. You can do it. And so we can use it to define some elements. Sorry, is there a question? No, apparently. Called Vn. So we define inductively V0 is P. And then in pi star, sorry, in L mod, V0, Vn minus one, multiplication by P has of the is of the form of some element Vn times X to the P to the N plus higher order terms. So this is Vn is really an element of L mod V0, Vn minus one. And it's an end Vn is a non-zero divisor. But nothing of these is, is really hard to prove. It takes a while. It's a bit of algebraic manipulations with formal group loads. But... And note that also, even if it's not in the notation, Vn depends from P. Uh, OK. So we have these elements. We have V0 in pi star of mu, which is L. We have V1 in pi star of mu mod P. We have V2 in pi star of mu 
mod p comma t1, etc. You have this sequence of elements. Oh, and maybe I should say that vi is in degree uh, two by i minus one. That you can just deduce it from this formula. But... Oh, the use from this formula and the fact that the degree of the indeterminate is actually minus two. And in the identification between pi star of mu one and L. Okay. So that's what happens. So now we have our elements Vn and I can actually define some, you know, this is, let me put some tildes since these are not quite the, the spectra that are usually called En, um, although they have the same Bausch field localization, they induce the same Bausch field localization. So for our purposes, it's okay. It's going to define these mu mod p vn minus one no sorry but vn plus one i need to kill all the one greater than vn and then i invert vn and we define ln is the localization of these guys here And similarly, I can take K and tilde. Again, I'm putting a tilde because they're not quite um, the, the things that are normally called En and Kn. In fact, these guys, these guys with the tilde, they compose as direct sums of pieces that are simpler, which are what are usually called En and Kn. Uh, but this is En tilde modulo V0 Vn minus one. Excuse me, I have a formal question. Yes. So uh, do you make any choices to divide by Vn plus one without dividing by V1 and previous you, ones? You're absolutely right. You have to make a okay. choice here. Um, OK, thanks. Um, there, there is a canonical way of contract, constructing this Ln that doesn't make any choice, actually. Uh, but for the sake of giving a short argument here, I'm just making choices. Hmm. And sorry, and LKN is this L to KN tilde. KN tilde is a sum of many, many copies of another spectrum called KN. And that's what these guys are called. And okay, I have 15 minutes. So, how much do you want to say about this? So, first of all, there is, and this is actually easy to prove using the same techniques. I I, um, I used so far, it's the chromatic fracture square. You can, for every spectrum X, there exists a pullback square. L and X, L, K and X to L and minus one X and uh, let me get this right L and minus one L K and X. So you can inductively build L N by all the L K N's plus gluing data. Okay, and that's actually not hard. I think you could do with what I said so far. Just to check that every K and local spectrum is in no. Yeah, that every K and local spectrum is EN local and every um, K and local spectrum is EN minus one acyclic uh, and uh, plus a couple more verification than this follows formally. As we prove the arithmetic fracture square. And then there is this theorem 
um, which is actually not that easy theorem at all, which is the chromatic convergence theorem. which is uh, if X is a finite spectrum, now it's important, it's false for general spectra, but it's true, for example, for the sphere spectrum. X is the same thing as the limit of its EN localizations. Sorry, not X, uh, it's p-completion, of course. Everything in the chromatic fracture square is p-complete, so you cannot hope to recover more than the p-completion, but. And uh, what else do I want to say? I want to say what these VIs show up and what the, the telescope conjecture has to do. So turns out that so for every N there exists, so I'm going to describe an inductive procedure. So I'm going to tell you we, we can construct something that's called S d0 to the i0, the n minus the n, sorry, to the i n, which is just a finite spectrum. In fact, from the construction I'll give you, it's, it's clear that there is a finite spectrum um, with a map v n plus one to the i n plus one from these yeah, uh, shifted by some degree that you can compute. It's i n plus one times the degree of v n plus one, of course. Inducing uh, v n plus one to the i n plus one on mu homology. And again, technically, if the exponents are big, this is not very well defined and saying it's a representative for, for this class, the n plus one to the en plus one. Uh, uh, and which is, uh, sorry, I should say, which is an um, en plus one, actually an ln plus one equivalence. And that's actually a consequence of some very, very big theorems. Uh, the new potence and uh, thick subcategory theorem. And you do have these working as before tells you that you have a map. And let me say that I'm just inversing Vn plus one, because of course inverting Vn plus one or inverting any of its powers. same and the theorem I'm sorry not the theorem the conjecture which is called the telescope conjecture says this map is an equivalence And this conjecture has a very rich history. Uh, it has been both proven and disproven in the literature at least a couple of times. Uh, none of these were correct, of course. Uh, I think the current consensus is that this conjecture is false. Uh, and there are good theoretical reasons for why it should be false. On the other hand, these uh, good theoretical reasons seem to apply also to the n equals one case, which is true. So I'm not exactly sure which position I should take here. Uh, it's, uh, I think, the most important of the conjectures from the 70s that's still unsolved. Uh, and as a corollary, you'd have uh, that x is e, uh, sorry, is ln local if and only if vn plus 1 acts invertibly on x it's a corollary of the of the conjecture which is which is assumed to be false these days so you know <laughs> take it with a grain of salt uh, 
And okay, and I think that the last thing I want to say is why this subject is called chromatic homotopy theory. So this subject is called chromatic homotopy theory. Oh, there is actually another thing I want to say, but okay, I'll say later. Um, because Ln of X sees the Vn periodic part of the homotopy groups of X, at least when X is finite. Well, okay, the, we don't have telescope conjecture, so this is not literally true, but what is true is that the homotopy groups of L and X modulo is V0, I0, Vn minus one, In minus one are uh, Vn periodic. So there is some power of Vn that acts invertibly. So you, you think of it as, so you think of this L and tower, this called the chromatic tower, actually let me call of the chromatic tower. L and X, L and minus one X, et cetera, goes to, oh, L zero X, maybe I should have mentioned it's just a rationalization because V zero is P. And that's also, the telescope conjecture is also true for, for P equals zero, of course, for, for N equals zero, of course. Uh, actually, sorry, not X rationalized, the P completion rationalized. Uh, sorry, very, very often in this subject, just assume the text is already P complete and, and call it a day just to, to make the notation less. Yeah. And when you think of this chromatic power as splitting the homotopy groups of X in its uh, constituent frequencies, so sort of like when you take a, a ray of light and you put in a prism, you get uh, different rays one in each, in each uh, with some frequency, so with some periodicity. So that's sort of what the, the goal of chromatic homotopy theory is. You take the constituent frequencies of your, of your spectrum and, uh, and then you try to put them together. And that's, as I said last time, it's called the transchromatic homotopy theory. And uh, oh God, that's even worse. Already understanding the K and localization of a spectrum is hard. Putting together, understand, putting them together involves understanding this piece here. And that's even worse. <laughs> that's, that's really complicated. Uh, but that's our best goal to understand the, the, hom the homotopy groups are more general, the stable homotopy category. And as Nicholas was saying uh, before I started recording, this corresponds to a filtration of the whole category of spectra. You can actually write the category of spectra as a bunch of pullbacks, uh, which as I hinted at, you could interpret as uh, some kind of shift descent condition over a, spa over a space that's sort of made like this with, home with open parts like this which is the Balmer spectrum of the, of the category of spectrum. So this is some kind of descent condition for a sheaf of categories somehow. Uh, and of course one could hope, okay, this is sort of like understanding the Zariski sheaf. And well, one of my dreams would be to write down a metal site and, and try to, to look at etal points, if you know about etal topology. But that's, uh, well, that's literally a matter of current research. There are a few people working on things related to this, but we don't have a, quite a complete story yet. So uh, I hope at least the idea of decomposing the category of spectra and its constituent frequencies is interesting. Yeah. I actually should say this works for the category of finite spectra, not for the category of old spectra. And that's sort of good enough for at least, well, maybe it's not good enough, but it's already much more than we can do. So we have to not be too greedy, I guess. Uh, 
okay. So this, sorry for this lecture, was perhaps a bit more vague with a lot less proofs, but I wanted to give you an idea of how this, these ideas of vast localizations have evolved. Um, I don't think it makes sense for me. Oh, no, sorry. I should actually say a different theorem, a last theorem here. So the theorem is this meshing localization theorem, which is true even if the telescope conjecture is not proven and, uh, and suspected to be false. Ln is smashing. This theorem is true with a different proof from the one that I did today, which of course used the task of conjecture for KU. Uh, but it is still true. So LN is, you can hope to understand LN if you understand LN of the sphere. Uh, of course, uh, understanding LN of the sphere is not as easy as understanding L1. Okay, so again, I think I'm not going to start a new topic now. I hope it was at least interesting to see uh, uh, how these ideas grow and become more generalized and, and go to, to show what you're doing. And next time we'll, I'll start talking about Tom Spectra, Spanier White Duality, and then Tom's Theorem on Manifolds. Uh, sorry, and the duality first, of course. I think that will leave us very little time. By the end of the semester, I might have one or two extra lectures, I'm not sure. Where I might do another, I don't know, general description of, of the developments of the theory instead of doing a new topic. Questions? Uh, yes, so I have a very vague question. Um, so I once heard that this Morava E theory spectra, so I mean, we, we looked at the E and tilde, not the ENs, but they are supposed to be somehow also primes. Yeah, no. Okay, so first of all, since you, you've heard about Morava E theory, I should mention that nothing I've written is actually related to Morava E theory, and just these are called Johnson Wilson theories. And they happen to have the same Bausfield class of the Morava E theory. So that, and since they're quicker to define, uh, that's what I'm using. But Morava E theories are, of course, a lot more canonical. When I say that there is a more canonical way of describing LN, I was referring to Morava E theories, uh, which take a while, that take some arithmetic geometry to, to define. So I'm not okay. going to do, but uh, Morava E theories, to, to answer your question, actually, um, which is more about LN than the EN really, is not a prime, is more like the complete local ring of the prime. Um, if you want, the analog of the prime would be this KN theories here yeah, that I define, okay, K, K and tilde actually is literally um, the sum of a bunch of, of I think, zero to P and minus one S two I K, the spectrum called KN, it splits like this. Mm -hmm. And these KNs are what are sometimes called prime fields of, um, of the stable homotopy theory, although I disagree with this assessment. I mean, they behave, so LKN actually behaves like at the completion of a prime. Uh, but KN are not, for example, are not ring spectra or rather they are E1 ring spectra, but not canonically so, and they are not commutative if N is greater than zero. So they behave more like uh, classes in the Brouwer groups of EN rather than primes. It's, um, uh, and also, I mean, this is super vague. Are these somehow points in the um, Balmer spectrum? The yes, sphere? this is known as the thick subcategory theorem. It's, oh, okay. Uh, one of the important theorems in chromatic homotopy theory, and the points of Balmer spectrums uh, depend on exactly two parameters, p and n, and they are exactly I mean, the p and n is the the one here, uh, except for n equals zero when uh, there is no p because it's rationalization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. N equals oh, okay. zero, you have only one point. 
So in fact, the, the space, the Balmer spectrum of the sphere, actually, I think you have like one point, this is kind of a generic point at zero, and then you have a chain of points going um, closer and closer points. And uh, uh, so this is like HQ, here we have K1, K2, etc. Uh, one for each prime until they arrive at something that's sometimes called k infinity, but you know under a different name, it's just HFP, uh, which is the closed point, it's sort of the residue field. Uh, this is not super important. I mean, it's important to make the Balmer spectrum a quasi compact topological space, but it, it's not important for the description of the opens because the opens are all, there is no open that contains only HFP. Okay. Sorry, no, these are the closed, yeah. I mean, yeah. the there is no quasi-compact open whose complement is HFP. If you want, the complement of HFP is not quasi-compact. So for the description of the, the sent statement is not, it's not very relevant. But okay, and, and the topology here is complicated. This is where the transchromatic phenomena happen also. when you, you try to glue different primes, uh, which how do, do, do these heights talk? That's, uh, but, but we understand this picture quite well, actually, I should say. The topological structure here is quite explicit. Then. Cool, thanks. Okay. Other questions? I should also perhaps say that there is another important conjecture called the chromatic splitting conjecture. That's essentially saying that this pullback is a stupid. You can write these as essentially some kind of sums of these and, sorry, these and, and the five, ooh, as sums of these and the fiber of this map. So this, well, this will tell you that ln of x is the, the, the sum of the LKIs. And people believe that this is uh, after non canonically so. And people believe in the truth of this statement. It's been verified for low degrees. Uh, but oof. I'm not sure if I do. I'm not sure what I believe in, <laughs> honestly, in these conjectures. Um, so it's kind of a weird conjecture. The conjecture precisely says that there is a map like this making the direct square commute. Other questions? Mm, yes, no, no, okay. Okay, so see you on Thursday and we'll do something a lot more concrete. Uh, but again, I hope this was interesting anyway. Let me stop the recording. <laughs>